Hey guys, Tom itself here with some more Kerbal Space Program. This video is about a Reddit weekly challenge called Orange Efficiency that's all about getting the most possible out of a single large orange fuel tank. I'm going to walk through my design process and then show off my failures and or success at completing the challenge. Now usually the best way to approach an efficiency challenge is with jet engines, but I'm not really familiar with jet engines in Kerbal Space Program, I'll just figure it out some other time. So what I'm going to do is all rocket engines, that's what I know, it's what I'm comfortable with, and uh, I'm just going to have to do the best I can with those. So first up I need my science probe, just going to take the lightest weight probe body I can, uh, strap on maybe some structural elements, and then one of each of the four science pieces of equipment, the accelerometer, the barometer, the temperature sensor, and then the gravity sensor, <laughs> I don't know what that's called, and then I'll probably stick a solar panel on there too, and since we're going to Duna, I don't need to worry about using engines to slow myself when I'm landing on the surface, I can just stick a basic parachute on top and call things good. Then I'll need a decoupler to get that off of my big orange fuel tank, I don't need, just need to get the probe to Duna, and that'll be good. What I'm trying to do here is determine my payload mass, how much stuff I'm actually trying to send to Duna, because that's going to help me in determining what engine is going to be the most efficient for me to use for this trip. And so I'm going to start in the interplanetary stage, essentially at the end, and work backwards. So I say efficient interplanetary engine, and you probably if you're familiar with Kerbal Space Program, you think immediately, ah, the atomic engine, they're super efficient, have an ISP of like 800, uh, normally nothing else, and even gets to 400. But the thing about those is they're really, really heavy. So if I don't have much payload, then most of the mass that I'm pushing around with my fuel that's also heavy is engine. It's kind of like trying to ride a unicycle that uses monster truck tires. Yeah, or maybe just trying to pull a baby stroller with a monster truck. But that's kind of the idea here. And so that if these atomic engines, they're fantastic, but they're not always the best choice. So we go to Tavert's mass optimal engine type uh, charts that he's prepared, and I'll link in the description below the Reddit thread. These are really useful for looking at these kinds of efficiency problems. Now on the bottom there, the x-axis, you've got a delta V, and on the y-axis, you've got payload mass in tons. This particular one is for vacuum with no thrust-to-weight ratio requirements, and there's a whole series of these for different uh, atmospheric or vacuum or different thrust-to-weight ratio uh, requirements. So what that's telling me is that there is a breakpoint here where I would rather go with the Rockamax 48.7S instead of the atomic engine uh, if I have lower delta V requirements or lower payload masses. And now the convention with his charts is that the mass of the engine and the dry mass of the fuel tank aren't considered as part of that payload mass. They're just figured into the calculations. You don't have to worry about them. But uh, because I'm not burning the entire volume of fuel in this big orange fuel tank in that interplanetary stage, it's going to be almost empty when I get up into orbit, in fact. Uh, I need to include most of the dry mass of this big orange fuel tank as payload mass, so that's almost another two tons. In the end, I have to add some more other stuff, SAS and whatnot, I have just over five tons of payload mass by my rough estimates. And to get to Duna, I'm going to need a ballpark 1,500 meters per second delta V. So let's go back to that first chart. You can certainly make it with less, but I need plenty of margin for error and given my piloting skills. Anyway, we look at this, and about 5, 6 tons payload mass, uh, 1,000, 2,000 delta V, and we're just below the atomic line, and so I'm going to go ahead and use one of the Rockamax 48.7S's for my interplanetary engine. Now, for our lift stage, just move on to a different chart, this time atmospheric delta V, and I need to specify a thrust to weight ratio at least 1.5, preferably a little more, and you know, I look at this, uh, getting out of the atmosphere 4,500 meters per second, and a payload of, well, it's it's over 10 tons because I'm still going to be carrying some fuel, and that puts me clearly into the region of aerospikes being the mass optimal engine type for this mission. 
Now, if you're familiar with aero spikes, you'll know that they have no thrust vectoring, so I have to add some additional fins to make sure things are going to stay okay while I'm using those aero spikes. And that hopefully that SAS unit, the aero spikes, and then as I get higher up, I'll turn on that little tiny Rocco Max engine. Hopefully that'll be enough to keep me flying straight. A goodbye mech jeb, because you're not allowed for these challenges, and we'll give this a try. And on my first try, things are actually going fairly well at first, until I jettison two of my four aero spikes and turn on the one Rockomax, little Rockomax engine, and the craft just becomes incredibly unstable. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened here, but suddenly it just starts spinning all over the place. I completely lose control. <laughs> just, I don't quite understand. I assume that even though I had the symmetry options on, something is unbalanced somewhere, or there's thrust, or something got damaged when I uh, dropped those two engines off, and it just it does not want to fly straight. <laughs> it's, it's fairly horrifying. There's completely no control whatsoever. And so I just say, screw it, and I don't normally do this, but I just, I decided the thing had to crash, and so, as difficult as it is to control, I managed to point it down and just put it right into the ocean, reload, and try again. Yes, let's just go right back into the ground, huh? Good. Good, there you go. And it's off we go again. There are a few things I learned from a quick test run I did before I started recording for the challenge, and one of the big issues I ran into was that most engines, uh, the big ones, the mainsails, your skippers, a lot of those generate electric power while they're in use, and so that makes it really easy to use a lot of power in SAS, uh, and you don't have to have a whole bunch of solar panels or batteries ready to go. Well, the issue with aero spikes and the little tiny 48.7S is that none of those generate electric power, and so I had to bring along a couple more batteries and some solar panels to help with launch and my uh, exit burn. Uh, to get out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. Because I'm going to Duna, a lot of that burn happens on the dark side of the planet away from the sun, and so even if I got solar panels out, I'm not getting any additional electricity. And so I could run into some nasty situations where I've got the engine started up and I'm burning, and it isn't until I get out of the shadow of the planet that I start getting power and control back for my probe. <laughs> that, was, that was not a good situation to be in. Oh man, this was a this one's one heck of a gravity turn to try to control. So I'm slowly spinning and yet generally headed in the right direction, and not the most efficient ascent. <laughs> I've chosen my engines well, and so that's going to make up for my lack of piloting skills. Anyway, if I'd gone with the atomic engine instead, that might have kept me from having to carry those extra solar panels and batteries, because that does generate electricity while it's in use, and that maybe not during liftoff, that might have been a bit questionable, but definitely during an exit burn, I would have had that to power me through that while I was in the shadow of the planet, and using lots of electricity for SAS to keep myself pointed in the right direction. And as I push my apoapsis well out of the atmosphere, I can go ahead and ditch those two aero spikes. It's not that they're inefficient, they're actually remarkably efficient for what they do. It's that they're heavy, and I don't need to be carrying any more extra mass at this point. I'm down to not a whole lot of fuel left, and so ditching that extra weight is a good thing. <laughs> it's kind of nice watching the fins flip back around as it floats back off into space. Anyway, you can see the additional solar panels and batteries I had to add in order to make sure I had enough power. But it's time to start worrying about the circularization burn, and then planning out the exit burn to get to Doom. To do that, I'm going to use another tool I found through Reddit, and that is Alex Moon's KSP Launch Window Planner. This is really useful because it just gives me a date on which I can make the precise burn in order to get where I need to. The thing is, those angles are actually really hard to line up, <laughs> so if I know a, have a good idea of which day that is, that's going to mean I don't have to very tr accurately try to measure that angle makes a lot of sense. You just have to go in through the Space Center to find the current date. That is, unless I have MechJeb, in which case it'll tell me. Anyway, I'm already set this up so this is the right date. I just need to set up the burn that he specified here, and that should get me to Duna. 
All I do is add a maneuver node, set the delta V to what he says, 1060 in this case, and then play with the timing just ever so slightly until I get my encounter. And that's, that's all there is to it. Actually, kind of nice once you figure out how it works. Then I just go ahead and make that burn. It, it does take a little while. I got a tiny engine. This out thrust from this single 48 uh, Rockomax engine is actually less than that from, a, from an atomic engine. So it's a good thing the craft doesn't weigh a whole lot. Otherwise, this would be a ridiculously long burn. But nonetheless, after a little while, we go ahead and get there. And I can just let things cruise until we're closer to Duna. And so there'll be one or two more corrections on my way to Duna, and then once I get into Duna's sphere of influence, it'll be a lot easier to see what's going on, and I'll make a last correction to go ahead and get my encounter with it. So it turns out I end up coming in on the South Pole. Uh, that's fine, I don't really care where I land for this. The challenge, even in hard mode, really not that difficult. Uh, that's okay, I mean, <laughs> it means I'm able to do it. But, uh, you know, hey, they could have made it harder, really terrible, terrible ascent there off of Kerbin, and not the best course, but uh, I'm going to say good selection of engines, and well, I had some issue with design there, that was part of the, uh, the stability issues on launch, but nonetheless, I, I made it, uh, so I'm proud of myself. Again, not the hardest challenge, but I think, as uh, someone noted in the Reddit thread, this is really good practice for career mode, which is coming out in the next Kerbal Space Program release. Don't know when that is, but looking forward to it, looking forward to doing some science. Anyway, a nice view of Duna there, a big red planet next to our big orange fuel tank. Anyway, I had some fuel left, wasn't sure how aggressive I wanted to be with the landing, so I decided I'd just stop my vertical velocity and let the parachute deal with the horizontal aspect. <laughs> the result was kind of funny, so check this out. Coming down, everything's looking good, getting some nice re-entry effects in that thin Duna atmosphere. Uh, burning vertically, but I don't have enough thrust to even escape Duna with this little tiny engine. So I just keep on going down towards the planet. And I'm not quite sure how, uh, how high the surface is here. It's obviously not sea level, but there isn't any real sun, and I can't really see the terrain below. So I'm not sure exactly how much further I have to go to the surface. But I'm coming along here and I realize I'm under 3,000 meters. I should probably go ahead and separate these things. And then the fuel tank just goes poof, pop, and disappears as the parachute pulls the probe back. As the probe slowly floats down with a view of Ike in the background. And we're coming in at just over 5 meters per second. I think that'd be okay if we landed on the bottom. And, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't. I land kind of on my side on the slope, and I break off my solar panel. And so I have to quickly get in there and say, oh no, I'm gonna run out of power on this thing. So I have to hurry in order to check all the, the, all the uh, science instruments are working before the probe runs completely out of power, because I have no way to get more power to it at this point. So I'm trying to use the SAS to keep it from rolling down the hill, and then uh, also check on all the science instruments. But they're all functional, they're all still here, and well, I, I guess I'll call it good enough. As the probe slowly runs out of power and dies. Nonetheless, I think that is a successful completion of the challenge. The first one I've completed, by far probably the easiest one out there, but hey, I, I did it. I'm happy with it. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something useful if you're in the Kerbal Space Program or you just, again, if you enjoyed it. Anyway, let's do a little time lapse here, and I will see you guys next time.